Hello students, welcome to EPG Pathshala. I am Dr. Ranjana Saxena, Associate Professor from Dhyal Singh College, University of Delhi. Today, we are going to discuss on the module Morphology, Life Cycle, Pathogenicity and Prophylaxis of Drachenkiller's Medinensis from the paper Parasitology. After studying this unit, you will be able to understand the medical importance of Drachenkiller's Medinensis, identify the female worm from its morphological characteristics, explain the importance of the two hosts in the life cycle of Drachenkiller's Medinensis and highlight the symptoms of the disease caused by the parasite. You will also be able to suggest various methods for the prevention and control of the parasite. Colloquially, Drachenkiller's is named as Genia worm, so called because it was discovered in Genia in West Africa. It is also known as Medina worm, commonly found in Medina and hence the name. In the Bible, Drachenkiller's is called as Fairy Serpent. The Greeks and the Romans called it as Little Snakes. Dragon Worm and Serpent Worm are some other names given to it. As you can see here, there are basically two important species of Drachenkiller's. Drachenkiller's Medinensis and Drachenkiller's Insignis. Drachenkiller's medinensis is a parasite found in the subcutaneous tissues of humans, dogs, cattle, horses and foxes. Whereas Drachenkiller's insignis is found in the wild carnivores, dogs and cats. They have so far been reported only from America. Here I shall be talking about Drachenkiller's medinensis. It was Carl Linnaeus in 1758 who first suggested that they were worms. Russian naturalist Alexei Fedchenko in 1870 studied the life cycle of the parasite and found that it was a digenetic nematode. He discovered that the larvae emerging from the protruding female worm in the infected limbs of a person further developed in another host, the cyclops, which is a freshwater crustacean. Disease caused by Drachenkiller's medinensis is called Drachentiasis. In Greek, Draco means dragon or serpent, and hence the name. The name Drachentiasis was given by Galen. The disease is caused by the female worm. Before talking about Drachenkiller's in details, let us first classify Drachenkiller's. Drachenkiller's belongs to the phylum Nematoda class Sesanentia, order Spirida, family Drachenculidae. Talking about the geographical distribution, it was widely distributed right from India, Pakistan, Burma, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Soviet Union, Africa, right to West Indies. In India, it was reported from Punjab, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, down to Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh. It has been found that the worm prefers dry locations. Areas of abundant rainfall are comparatively freer from the worm. According to the WHO report, Drachenkiller's medinensis has been eradicated from several countries, as you can see in the image. Africa, Asia and Middle East, from these places it has totally been eradicated. It is now found only in some of the African states. Drachenkiller's medinensis has been totally eradicated from India. We can see in the graph that the number of reported cases of Drachenkiller's or Drachenkiller's has been drastically reduced from the year 1986 to the year 2010. There were 3.5 million cases reported in 1986. By the year 2010, 
only 1,797 cases of dracontiasis have been reported. The geniaperm eradication program has drastically reduced the dracontiasis cases from 3.5 million, as was reported from Asia and Africa in 1986, to just 126 cases in 2014. The day is not far off when genia worm disease will be globally eradicated. Now let us see, where does this parasite live in the body of the vertebrate host? The parasite lives in the subcutaneous tissues of humans and other vertebrates, especially just under the skin of legs, ankles, arms and neck and can migrate from one site to another. Trachinculus medinensis is a digenetic parasite requiring two hosts to complete its life cycle. The definitive host are humans, dogs, cats and other wild animals. The intermediate host is a freshwater crustacean, Cyclops. The parasite also has a reservoir host. Humans are the only reservoir of infection. Many animals such as dogs, cats, foxes, are found to be naturally infected with killers. However, these animals do not constitute any reservoir of infection to humans. As you can see in the slide, body of killers is cylindrical, smooth and milky white. The head bears a chitinous shield on which are present six papillae. Adults possess six conspicuous labial papillae and eight external papillae. Trachinculus shows sexual dimorphism. In this figure, you can see the mature male Trachinculus and the mature female Trachinculus. A gravid female is being shown with the extruded uterus. Now let us see how we can identify the adult female worm and the adult male worm. Let us first talk about the adult female worm. Let me also tell you that the adult female is one of the largest nematode known to cause infection to human beings. It is a slender, long, milky white worm measuring about a meter in length and about 1.5 to 1.7 millimeter in thickness, resembling a piece of long white twine thread. The female worm has an anterior end and a tapering posterior end, which is bent to form a chitinous hook. The female dracunculus is didelphic. The gravid female has two uteri full of embryos. All other organs, including the elementary canal, gets atrophied. Roughly about 3 million embryos can be found in the uterus of a gravid female. The worm is viviparous and discharges the embryos in successive batches for about three weeks. By the time, the uterus gets completely empty. Now let us see how we can identify an adult male worm. The males are much smaller than the females, measuring only about 12 to 30 mm in length and 0.5 mm in width. The posterior end of the male is spherical and bears 10 pairs of genital papillae. Four of them are preanal and six pairs are postanal papillae. As in other nematodes, the male dracunculus has a common opening for the anus and the genital aperture which is called the cloaca. Cloaca is present at the posterior end of the worm, a little in front of the tail end. Now here it becomes very necessary to mention that in case of female killers, 
the anus is present at the posterior end while the genital aperture or the gonopore is present in the middle one-third region of the body. Males also possess an accessory reproductive organ known as spicules. Another accessory reproductive organ is called gibernaculum. The two, that is the spicules and the gibernaculum, help them in opening the vulva of the female during copulation and thus they assist in mating. The spicules are of unequal length in Dracunculus and are enclosed in a spicular sheath. They are protectile in nature. When not in use, they lie within the spicular sheath. Only when copulation is to take place, they project out of the spicular sheath in order to open the vulva of the female. Gibernaculum, on the other hand, is a sclerotized thickening of the cuticle formed from the spicule pouch and lies on the dorsal side of the cloaca and probably help to guide the spicules in opening the vulva of the female worm. The males die after copulation as they have not been reported from man. Males have only been recovered from some of the experimental animals. Dracunculus medinensis is a viviparous worm that liberates a larva. The larva of Dracunculus is known as rhabditoid larva. As you can see in the image, it has a long coiled body with rounded head and long slender tapering tail. It measures about 650 to 750 mu m in length and 17 to 20 mu m in width. After studying the morphology of Dracunculus medinensis, let us see what its life cycle is like. It is a digenetic parasite, as has been already told to you earlier, requiring two hosts to complete its life cycle. The definitive host are humans, dogs, cats, and other wild animals, while the intermediate host is cyclops, which is a freshwater crustacean. To be very precise, the intermediate host is mesocyclops, Luicati. The lifespan of female is one year and that of male is six months. Males are short-lived. They die soon after copulation. Another important thing to remember is that the female is viviparous. Copulation takes place in deeper connective tissues. During copulation, the male orients itself in such a manner that the male gonopore coincides with the female gonopore. Spicules, gibernaculum and genital papillae help the male in opening the vulva of the female during copulation and in the transfer of the sperms. Life cycle starts with the development of young worms within the body of the female. When the young are ready to emerge from the uterus, the female comes beneath the surface of the skin of the host in order to release them in water. The female worm produces a toxin that forms a blister in the host's skin which regularly comes in contact with water. For example, hands, sole of the feet, arms and legs of washerman, back of water carriers, bishtis, they are they're called as bishtis, etc. Eventually, the blister bursts and a small ulcer is formed on the skin. When the whole skin comes in contact with water, as when bathing and washing clothes, the uterus of the female worm is projected out of the ulcer cavity and a milky fluid containing myriads of coiled young worms are released into the water. Contact with water stimulates the worm to release coiled embryos in water. The process continues for two to three weeks till the young ones are all released into the water.
when the host leaves the water, the exposed end of the uterus dries and shrivels and blocks the further release of the larvae. The larvae are called rhabditoid larva, as has already been discussed earlier. It has a long coil body with rounded head and long slender tapering tail. After the larva comes out in water, it moves about briskly, coiling and uncoiling its body in search of a suitable intermediate host, which is Mesocyclops luicati, a very specific host. Further development takes place in this intermediate host. As they swim about in water, some of them may be eaten by cyclops. Unless taken up by cyclops, the rhabditoid larva can live only for a short period of four to seven days. Each cyclops can ingest 15 to 20 larvae of the genia worm. The infected cyclops can live for about a month or so. They usually die in about 40 days. However, it has been found that with heavy infestation, the cyclops do not survive for more than 15 days. It should be mentioned here that the normal lifespan of cyclops is about three months. Within the crustacean, the young genia worm break through the mid-intestinal wall within one to six hours after ingestion, then migrate to the hemocele. Hemocele is the body cavity of cyclops. There it undergoes two molds and becomes the infective third instar larva in 10 to 20 days. Man acquires the infection by ingesting cyclops containing third instar infective larva in drinking water. Cyclops is digested by the host gastric juices in the stomach. Under the influence of digestive juices, the larvae become active and penetrate the gut wall. They then migrate through the host intestinal wall into the deeper connective tissue and the retroperitoneal connective tissue where they mold twice to attain maturity in three to four months. The worm is guided towards their final destination purely by physical factors. Sense organs, both visual as well as auditory, are absent in these worms. Fertilization takes place here. Males die after copulation and are absorbed by the host and disappear within six months of infection. Growth and development of female is slow and it takes six months to one year for the female to mature and select proper site for discharging the embryos in water. It selects only those parts of the skin that are liable to come in contact with water. A local inflammatory reaction is then produced by the female and the entire life cycle is completed in about a year. So in this image, you can see the entire life cycle of Dracunculus medinensis, which I have just explained, starting from the definitive host, which is man, to the cyclops, the intermediate host, and again from cyclops, how it enters into the body of man. So now let us see, in brief, what is the source of infection of Dracunculus medinensis? Yes, it is the infected cyclops. What is the infecting agent? Cyclops containing third stage larva. What is the port of entry? Oral contaminated water. And what happens to Dracunculus once it enters the body of the definitive host? That is, where does it, what is its final abode? The site of localization. It is subcutaneous tissue of exposed parts like legs, back, arms and ankles. Incubation period, it is 8 to 12 months. Period between infection and the emergence of the female parasite in the blister, that is the wound that is formed, that is the prepatent period, is 10 to 14 months. Now let us see a little about the genomics of Dracunculus medinensis. Not much molecular work has been done on the endoparasite Dracunculus. Scientists have shown that the Dracunculus medinensis 18 srRNA sequences are 1,819 bases long and the other important Dracunculus 
Krakenkelis insignis 18S rRNA sequences are 1,821 bases long and differed from each other at eight positions, which only amounts to a difference of about 0.44%. Phylogenetic position of Drachenkillus had been studied by comparing the 18S rRNA sequences of various nematodes. As you can see in the image of the various spirurids studied, Drachenkillus have a close relationship with Phylometra obturans while other spirits like Vachiriria bancrofti and Brugia mali are more close to the Rigonematida, it was Ivan Skin in et al. in 1971 who has shown that Drachenkillus and Philometra morphologically shared a close resemblance. The first thing that comes to our mind is why are we studying about Drachenkillus? We are studying about Drachenkillus because it causes harm to human beings. It causes a disease which is known as Drachenkillosis or Drachentiasis or Drachenkillosis. Infection in human is asymptomatic until the female worm reaches the surface of the skin and is ready to discharge the larva. Third instar larvae are not pathogenic. They essentially do not produce any pathological lesion in humans either after they are released from cyclops in the stomach or during penetration of intestinal mucosa and migration in the viscera and deep somatic tissues. As has been already mentioned earlier, only the female adult worm is pathogenic. Symptoms of Drachenkillosis are absent until a skin sore begins to form. Some of the common symptoms are nausea, diarrhea, giddiness, skin rash, itching, sometimes asthma may occur, or one may also have allergic reaction. All these symptoms are because of the toxins produced by the parasite. As I have just said that the symptoms of drachenkillosis are absent until a skin sore begins to form. The skin sore leads to the formation of Blister. Blister formation appears whenever the gravid female worm makes an attempt to come to the surface of the body, purely guided by instinct, and pierces through the skin to discharge its embryos. The worm secretes an irritant, which is histamine-like substance that produces a small red spot, which gradually becomes a small blip or blister, as you can see in the image. Blister formation is accompanied by intense burning pain. Over the next few days, the blister vesiculates, that is, a fluid appears in the blister. Finally, the blister ruptures, exposing a small superficial erosion. A small round hole may be seen at the center of the erosion, as you can see in the image. This hole leads to a tunnel in the subcutaneous tissue where the gravid female worm lies. Now, the gravid female worm protrudes its head through this hole whenever it comes in contact with water. Discharge of larva is intermittent. Sore is not usually more than 5 mm in diameter. Discharge of larva is intermittent. Sore is not usually more than 5 mm in diameter but can become larger and sometimes becomes secondarily infected with bacteria. Sore is usually on feet, legs or arms, but occasionally on other exposed parts of the body also. During next few weeks, the worm dies and is slowly absorbed in the tissue, after which the ulcer heals. Fluid in the blister is bacteriologically sterile and yellow in color. It contains many monocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, polymorphonuclear leukocytes and granulocytes. Many embryos remain coiled up in this fluid. As you can see in the image, many worms are coiled up in the wound. Secondary bacterial infection in the open wound is possible as I have already said earlier on. Once the embryos have been discharged by the gravid female, the local discomfort diminishes. The problem now is to remove the dead worms because these worms may cause arthritis 
and paralysis of spinal cord if they get lodged in the joints or get calcified in the soft tissues. Sometimes the worms may die prematurely and get calcified in the bones and thereby triggering arthritis, locked joints or premature deformities and in some cases may lead to deformity, complete deformity. In the image here, we can see that a man is extracting out the Drachenculus medinensis worm from the wound. So if the female worm are near the surface of the skin, they can easily be removed by carefully twisting around a stick. This method of extracting the worm may take some days or even weeks. Care should be taken that the worm does not break off in between as that might lead to complications because of the release of certain chemicals. Secondary bacterial infection, I repeat, is quite common, sometimes even leading to tetanus. So this technique of extracting out the worm on a stick was for the first time devised by Moses and is still in practice in some of the endemic areas. The host immune system only starts to respond when the female worm comes up to the surface of the skin of the exposed part, like the ankle, in order to release the larvae. The parasite tries to evade the host immune system. It is believed that the worm secretes opioids, morphine 6, glucuronide, that suppresses the immune response of the body. It is also believed that the worm coats themselves with proteins that identifies them as part of the host and therefore go unnoticed. Talking about the epidemiology, the disease is prevalent in areas where people do not have safe water to drink. There is no vaccine till date to prevent trachentiasis. Chances of reinfection are common as there is no protective immunity against Genia worm. There is no drug treatment for the fairy serpent. How can we diagnose Drachenculus medinensis in the body of the vertebrate host? The adult can be found when the female worm comes up to the surface of the skin to release embryos. As far as the embryo of the worm is concerned, the affected part through which the head of the worm is protruding may be bathed with water in order to stimulate the discharge of embryos from the uterus which can then be examined under the microscope. Worms in the deeper tissues after death either become calcified or absorbed. Skyography reveals such calcified worms. Intradermal injection of trachentilis antigen in patients suffering from trachentiasis causes a wheel to appear in about 24 hours. Recently, Falcon assay screening test, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, fast ELISA, an enzyme-linked immunoelectrotransfer blot, EITB. These techniques are used to test human sera with Drachenculus medinensis adult worm antigen. What is the prophylaxis for Drachenculus medinensis? Drink clean filtered water. Boiled water is always safe to drink. Keep away people with sores from contaminating wells, laundry and bathing water. And the important is to eradicate the vector cyclops by encouraging cyclops-eating fishes in ponds and streams used by people or by chemical treatment of water. There is no drug treatment for the fairy serpent. Antihistaminics and steroids, they only help in the initial stages of allergic reactions. Drug therapy has no lethal effect on the worm but helps to reduce the swelling and also in removing the worm easily by surgical methods. Now let us summarize what all we have studied about Drachenculus medinensis. Drachenculus medinensis is a somatic nematode which requires two hosts to complete its life cycle. One is the definitive host, human and an intermediate host, which is a cyclops, mesocyclops leucotti. It is a viviparous parasite. Infective stage is the cyclops containing the third instar rhabdatiform larva. Humans get the infection by drinking contaminated water 
containing the infected cyclops. Larvae, once inside, are digested out of the cyclops by the acidic juices of the stomach. The larvae then migrate through the intestinal wall and reach the retroperitoneal connective tissue where they grow and attain maturity. The male dragon killer resides in the retroperitoneal connective tissue and dies shortly after copulation. The female dragon killer is the largest nematode and is found in the subcutaneous tissues in the legs, arms and back and causes draconculiasis or draconitiasis. Clinical manifestations are because of the female emergence through the skin. Its body fluid is toxic and blister appears as the female worm makes an attempt to pierce through the skin in order to discharge the embryos. Secondary bacterial infection is quite common in persons infected with drachenculus. Drachenculiasis or drachentiasis is a waterborne disease. Safe drinking water, therefore, not allowing infected persons from entering water bodies like ponds, step wells, etc. and removal of cyclops from the water bodies can help in the prevention of the disease.